Well, I'd first like to say how honored I feel and privileged to be able to give this Keenan lecture today. I'm very grateful for the invitation. I'm very grateful for the President's introduction and very grateful for Elizabeth Kish's very warm introduction. It was very nostalgic for me since I remember her from our Oxford days. And it was nice that she mentioned the seminar that the four of us had. I remember in the last day when I was leaving Ronnie Dworkin, the lawyer, um, stopped me and said, you know, Amartya, many things have happened. We, we gave it for 10 years, in these 10 years. But one thing has been constant. You and I have never agreed. <laughs> <laughs> and given the fact that our political positions are quite close to each other, it's quite amazing how cantankerous we managed to be. I'm happy to say that if Ronnie had been present here, he would not have agreed with today's talk either. <laughs> so there's no danger of my standards falling. <laughs> the idea of human rights has gained a great deal of ground in recent years. And it has acquired something of an official status in international discourse. Weighty committees meet regularly to talk about the fulfillment and violation of human rights in different countries in the world. Certainly, the rhetoric of human rights is much more widely accepted today, indeed much more frequently invoked, than it has ever been in the past. At least the language of national and international communication seems to reflect a shift in priorities and emphasis compared with the prevailing dialectical style even a few decades earlier. And yet, this apparent victory of the idea and use of human rights coexists with some real skepticism in critically demanding circles about the depth and coherence of the approach. Is there something a little simple-minded about the entire conceptual structure that underlies the oratory on human rights? It is not typically disputed that the invoking of human rights can be politically powerful and may even be a great force for good in the world of practical affairs. Rather, the worries relate to the intellectual, what is seen as softness, some would even say mushiness, of the alleged conceptual framework of human rights. Many moral and political philosophers and legal theorists see all this as loose talks, perhaps perfectly benign, and may even be laudable loose talk, but it is not to be admired for anything like intellectual force or robustness. Indeed, it's not hard to notice an air of scholarly indulgence on the part of some commentators who find the use of the idea of human rights, quote unquote, a good thing, but confess to some embarrass, embarrassment if they were taken to be believers in the theoretical soundness of that good thing. In this variation of Gresham's law, it may not be so much that good currency is driven out by bad, but the currency of rough and ready practicality is seen as driving out the intellectually exacting currency that philosophers and jurists may find <coughs> rigorous and sound. What then appears to be the problem. I think there are three rather distinct concerns that critics tend to have about the intellectual edifice of human rights. There is first the worry that human rights confound consequences of legal systems which give people certain well-defined rights with pre-legal principles that cannot really give one a justiciable right. This is the issue of the standing of human rights. How can it have any standing except in terms of the entitlements that are authorized by the state as a repository of claims and immunities? Human beings in nature are in this view no more born with human rights than they're born fully clothed. Rights would have to be acquired through legislation just as clothes are acquired through tailoring. If the rights or the clothes don't fit, we have to grumble about the arrangements that provided them 
in the form in which they were provided. And that would be the critique that would proceed, that it just confounds the issue of the legitimacy of these rights. It goes, jumps into the rhetoric too early. I shall call it the legitimacy critique. The second line of skepticism does not take quite such a legal and institutional form, but sees human rights as being in the domain of social ethics. The moral authority of human rights, in this view, is conditional on the nature of acceptable ethics. But are such ethics universal? What if some cultures do not regard rights as, as being particularly valuable compared with other prepossessing virtues or rectitude? The disputation of the reach of human rights had often come from such cultural critiques. Perhaps the most prominent of these is the one based on the idea of allegedly skeptical attitude of Asian values towards human rights. Human rights, justify that name, demand universality. But there are no such universal values, the critics claim. I shall call this the cultural critique. The third line of attack concerns the form that the ethics and politics of human rights take. Rights are entitlements that require, in this view, correlated duties. If person A has a right to some X, then there has to be some agency, say B, which has a duty to provide A with that X. This is seen as posing a tremendous problem for taking human rights to be rights at all. It may be all very nice, so the argument runs, to say that he, every human being has a right to food or to medicine, but so long as no agency-specific duties have been characterized, these rights, it is argued, cannot really mean anything very much. Human rights, in this view, are heartwarming sentiments, but they are, strictly speaking, incoherent. They're not so much as rights, but as but lumps in the throat. I shall call this the coherence critique. The legitimacy critique has a long history. It has been aired in different forms by many skeptics of right-based reasoning about ethical issues. There are interesting similarities as well as differences between, say, Karl Marx's critique of seeing rights as claims that proceed that precede rather than follow the emergence of a state. He's been critical of giving it prior to, giving right prior to the existence of a state. This is spelled out in his combatively forceful, rather brilliant pamphlet on the Jewish question. And the reasons that Jeremy Bentham gave, I'm saying that there are similarities as well as differences between them, and the reason that Jeremy Bentham gave for describing natural rights as, I quote, nonsense, and the concept of, I quote, natural and imprescriptible rights as, I quote again, nonsense on stilts, <laughs> which I take to be artificially elevated nonsense. <laughs> but common to these and many other lines of critics is an insistence that rights must be seen as institutional instruments rather than any, as any kind of basic ethical entitlement. This militates against the idea of human rights in a rather fundamental way. Since the concept of natural rights, preceding states and laws and institutions, had been invoked again and again in the traditional literature, in the old literature, to justify various privileges and advantages, Bentham's and Marx's antipathy to that approach may be easy to understand. In fact, Bentham in particular was very keen on the importance of rights, legal rights, as practical institutions. And he wrote on that extensively, discussing the forms and the typologies involved. What he was disputing, rather, is the belief that rights can have fundamental as opposed to instrumental importance, thereby going against convictions that were eloquently expressed in contemporary writings, contemporary to him, that is, for example, in Tom Paine's Right of Man, of Mary Wollstonecraft's The Vindication of the Rights of Women, 
both published in 1792, around, around, right around the time that Bentham was producing his great utilitarian works. To Bentham, rights were, more, were mere instruments to the ultimate objectives, and these, he thought, should be basically, that these objectives, should take basically the form of maximization of the sum total of happiness. Bentham's claims can be split into two parts. One, that rights do not have intrinsic importance, only a derivative role, ideally in promoting utility, and two, any acknowledgement of rights, legally or morally, has consequential implications which must be examined. Even if one were to be rejected, I shall argue in that direction presently, the relevance of two, I would like to emphasize, is not disestablished. Rights cannot be evaluated and assessed, I shall argue, in a consequence independent way. It does matter what consequences follow from the recognition of one right or another. And I shall get on to that part of the, uh, in the latter part of the talk, I shall get on to a consequential view of rights. But this need not pose, I will argue, any real problem to a consequent sensitive approach to human rights as such. So the real problem is the status and importance of human rights, the real problem in the first critique. Certainly, seen as legal entities, pre-legal moral claims can hardly be seen as giving justiciable rights in courts and other institutions of enforcement. But to reject human rights on this ground is to miss the point of the exercise. The demand for legality is no more than just that, no more than just that namely a demand, which is justified by the ethical importance of acknowledging certain rights as being appropriate entitlements of all human beings without exception. In this sense, human rights may stand for claims, powers and immunities and other forms of warranty associated with the concept of rights, supported by ethical judgments, which attach intrinsic importance to giving these warranties, having these warranties on the part of everyone. In fact, human rights may also exceed the domain of potential as opposed to actual legal rights. Not only not actual legal rights, I am arguing now that it's not even best seen in terms of potential um, legal rights. A human right can be effectively invoked in context even when it's legal enforcement or indeed legislation to that effect would appear to be rather inappropriate. The moral right of a wife in a sexist society to participate fully as an equal in serious family decisions, no matter how chauvinistic her husband is, may be acknowledged by many to be quite important, who would nevertheless not want this requirement to be legalized and enforced by the police. The right to respect is another example in which leg legalization and attempted enforcement would be problematic, indeed even bewildering. I'm not of course denying that the recognition of human rights can serve as the basis of an argument for that entitlement to be legally acknowledged and reflected in many cases. But this connection, when it exists, is at best a possible implication of the ethical force of a moral right. It is not the defining principle of the moral standing of a human right. Any legal relevance of human rights must be dependent on the underlying ethical claim, and it is that claim, not its potential legality, that is constitutive of the idea of a human right. Returning to Bentham's critique, it's fair to acknowledge, fair to Bentham in particular, since he was so concerned with ethical issues, that he was not only describing natural rights as legal nonsense, which he did, but he was also arguing against a right-based reasoning format in ethics. Indeed, his advocacy of the utilitarian calculus was partly a dialectical rejection of right-based moral and political arguments. How successful is this utilitarian alternative? 
The utilitarian presumption that all normative issues can be reduced to the calculus of utilities is, I would argue, hard to accept. And indeed, I have tried to argue that elsewhere, and I'll very briefly discuss it here. No matter how utility is defined, as pleasure or desire fulfillment, or as numerical representation of choice, there would seem to be some need for going beyond an exclusive reliance on this informational base in making ethical judgments. I've discussed this issue elsewhere, as I mentioned, and will refer here only to a few of the problems that arise with utilitarian valuation. This relates, in my judgment particularly, to persistent deprivation and the adaptive desires to which such deprivation may lead. In particular, people accustomed to being in hopelessly deprived states may be forced by circumstances to learn to take pleasure in small mercies, to cut down ambitious desires, and to adapt choice behavior to resigned acceptance rather than rebellious discontent. This can indeed be a good way of quote-unquote coping and a sound adaptation to conditions beyond their own control or apparent control for the sake of uneventful survival. But this may be, while this may be a fine coping strategy, in the, nevertheless in the standard utilitarian calculus, this will have the calculus of consequence, this will have the consequence of muting and muffling the intensity of the deprivation involved, since the desires are cut in shape, pleasures are taken in small mercies, it will look as if the person is not having such a raw deal anyway. Most of our desires are getting fulfilled, overlooking the fact that the desires themselves are heavily constrained by sense of hopelessness, abject hopelessness. And similarly, pleasures are being generated out of um, small mercies because big mercies are not expected. The distortion brought about by this adaptive process would tend to hide the inequalities in the substantive opportunities and freedom that different people enjoy. This, I think, is the main problem in my judgment with utilitarianism, but inadequacies of utilitarian calculus have also been related and have been presented in that form in the literature to a number of other problems. And I've just mentioned them very briefly. One, the special importance of personal liberty, on which John Stuart Mill, himself a utilitarian, wrote powerfully. The arbitrariness of interpersonal comparison of utilities, on which John Rawls is particularly persuasive. And the distinction between the values that we cherish, or have reason to cherish, and the pleasures and desires that we actually experienced, well discussed by Bernard Williams in particular. If the ethical relevance of moral rights is to be dismissed, this can scarcely be done on the basis of some pre presumed adequacy or sufficiency of the alternative utilitarian calculus. Many of these problems can be effectively dealt with by including rights among the constitutive elements that have intrinsic normative value, thereby departing from the exclusive reliance on utilities. However, some critique, including utilitarian critique, seem to think that rights cannot be the starting point, of a starting point of a substantive moral theory. It's, it may work, but it's not a good starting point. How convincing is that claim? What can or cannot be the foundation of moral theory is, of course, a difficult question. That is clear enough. What is less clear is the plausibility of the standard utilitarian presumption that shared convictions about the importance of rights must be of necessity more arbitrary than relying on the experience of pleasure or choice. At one level, we are asking here a question about the form that a basic acknowledgement of intrinsic importance can take. It is not at all obvious why pleasure or desire must be uniquely suited to constitute what can ultimately be valued. Somehow it must be, in that odd view, denied that an intrinsic rather than derivative importance can be attached to a person being guaranteed something, such as an elementary liberty 
or the ability to get a little food or a little medicine. But if these are the things to which importance is indeed attached by us, and if we have reason enough to choose that form of valuation, such as the specificity of what we value, rather than seeing all this simply as being derived from a general valuation of desire or pleasure, then it seems extraordinary that these valuational forms would be rejected, uh, valuation forms in favour of liberty, uh, basic survival, etc., would be rejected in favour of a foundation that starts off elsewhere, in particular utilities. This takes us, however, to the second line of critique. Is the idea of human rights really so universal? Are there not ethics such as the world of Confucian cultures that tend to focus on discipline rather than on rights, on loyalty rather than on entitlement, insofar as human rights include claims to political liberty and civil rights, alleged tensions have been identified particularly by, as I mentioned, some Asian theorists. I've discussed this thesis in some detail in a previous lecture, the Morgan II Memorial Lecture at the Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs, which was published by Carnegie Council and also came out in the New Republic in July 1997. I don't want to therefore dwell on this very much, but very briefly go through the argument. In fact, the argument is that it's very hard to find any real basis of this intellectual claim in the history of Asian cultures, especially if we look widely at the Indic, Arabic or Persian writings on this subject. For, of the, for example, one of the earliest advocacy of the tolerance of pluralism and the duty of the state to protect minorities can be found in the inscriptions of Ashoka, the Indian emperor from the 3rd century BC. Asia is of course a very large area with 60% of the world's population and generalization about Asian values cannot obviously be very easy. Sometimes the advocates of Asian values have tended to look primarily at East Asia as the region of particular applicability. The generalization about the contrast between the West and Asia often concentrates on the land east of Thailand, even though there is a more ambitious claim that the rest of Asia is also, quote unquote, rather similar. For example, Lee Kuan Yew outlines, I quote, the fundamental difference, this is from Foreign Affairs, the fundamental difference between the Western concepts of society and government and East Asian concepts. And he goes on to explain, when I say East Asian, I mean Korea, Japan, China, Vietnam, as distinct from Southeast Asia, which is a mix between the cynic and the Indian, though Indian culture itself emphasizes similar values, unquote, this is Lee Kuan Yew. However, even East Asia, I mean, I think the claim about Indian culture is just not true, but even East Asia itself has a great deal more diversity than is acknowledged here. There are many variations to be found between Japan and China and Korea and other parts of East Asia, and even within a particular country, such as Japan specifically with Buddhist culture as well as Confucian culture, similarly China and Korea, all of them had a variety of cultural influences. Confucius is the standard author quoted in Interpreting Asian Values, but he is not the only intellectual influence in any of these countries. Furthermore, Confucian himself did, recommend, did not recommend blind allegiance to the state, contrary to some claims. When, for example, Zilu, one of those Confucian interlocutors, asks him how to serve a prince, Confucius replies, tell him the truth, even if it offends him. Confucius is, of course, not averse to practical caution and tact, but does not forego the recommendation to, for the need to oppose a bad government. I quote from Confucius, when the good way prevails in the state, speak boldly and act boldly. When the state has lost its way, act boldly, but speak softly. The monolithic interpretation of Asian values as hostile to, to democracy and human rights does not really bear critical scrutiny. I should, I suppose, not be too critical of the lack of scholarship in these beliefs 
since those who have made these claims are not scholars themselves, but political leaders, often official or unofficial spokesmen of authoritarian governments. However, I'm interested to see that while we academics can be impractical about practical politics, practical politicians can in turn be rather impractical about scholarship. It is not hard to find authoritarian writings, of course, within Asian traditions, but nor is it hard to find them in Western classics. And one has to reflect only on the writings of Plato or Aquinas to see that devotion to discipline is not especially Asian taste. To dismiss the plausibility of democracy as a universal value on grounds of some Asian writings on discipline and order would be like rejecting the plausibility of democracy as the natural form of gov government in Europe or America today on the basis of the writings of Plato or Aquinas, not to mention the vast medieval literature related to the Inquisition. Because of the experience of contemporary political battles, especially in the Middle East, the Islamic civilization is often portrayed as being fundamentally intolerant and hostile to individual freedom. But in the presence of diversity and variety within a tradition, sorry, but the presence of diversity and variety within a tradition applies very much to Islam as well. In India, Akbar and most of the other moguls, with the notable exception of Aurangzeb, almost a solitary example, provide good examples of both theory and practice of political and religious tolerance. Similar examples can be found in other parts of the Islamic culture. The Turkish emperors were often more tolerant than their European contemporaries. Abandoned examples of this can be found also in Cairo and Baghdad. Indeed, even the great Jewish scholar Maimonides in the 12th, 12th century had to run away from an intolerant Europe where he was born and from its persecution of Jews to the security of a tolerant and urban Cairo and the patronage of Sultan Saladin. Diversity is a feature of most cultures in the world. The agreed practice of democracy that has developed in modern West is largely the result of a consensus that has emerged since the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. To read in this a historical commitment of the West to democracy and, the, um, and, and then to contrast it with non-Western tradition, treating each as monolithic, would be a great mistake. The tendency towards oversimplification can be seen not only in the writings of some government spokesmen in Asia, but also in the theories of some of the finest Western scholars themselves. To mention an example from the writing of a major scholar whose works have been in many other ways very impressive, let me cite my colleague Samuel Huntington's thesis on the clash of civilizations, where the heterogeneities within each culture get very little quite inadequate recognition. His study has a clear conclusion, I quote, that a sense of individualism and a tradition of rights and liberties is to be found in the West, to, to be found in the West are unique among civilized societies, unquote. Huntington also argues, I quote again, the central characteristics of the West, those which distinguish it from other civilizations, antedate the modernization of the West. The West was West long before it was modern." Unquote. To take another distinguished example from a large variety of writings, Western writings in this case, anyone familiar with the works of Gertrude Himmelfarb would know what an exacting and visionary scholar she is. For example, her book, The Idea of Poverty, brings into the field formidable erudition and deep insights that have vastly enriched our understanding of poverty. And yet she concludes, in this case commenting on Martha Nussbaum's thesis on the value of cosmopolitanism, I quote, that ideas of justice, right, reason, and love of humanity are predominantly, perhaps even uniquely, Western values. And this is actually well beyond uh, um, Huntington. Uh, justice, right, reason, love of humanity. Quite tall claims. I remember when I was reading it, I remember being reminded of an old Bengali poem 
which is um, about Bengali parochialism. It's actually meant to be, uh, it's not to be taken terribly seriously, but it went like this. It's describing some neighbors, and I'm translating it freely from Bengali. It says, these neighbors, they are not Bengali. What can they possibly understand about the true meaning of relationships such as mother, father, brother, or sister? <laughs> The idea of human rights, which may or may not be as foundational as motherhood, but have very wide conceptual antecedents in ethics of different civilizations. The claim to uniqueness of the West as the repository of liberty and tolerance is as hard to sustain as the claim that Asian values are especially hostile to human rights in this form. The ethical arguments are not really as regionally, con regionally constrained and has be, as have been claimed by eloquent champions of cultural separatism of one kind or another. We have to judge the plausibility of human rights as a system of ethical reasoning and as the basis of political demand. This takes us to the third issue, that of coherence. There's a mainstream approach to rights that takes the view that rights can be sensibly formulated only in combination with correlated duties. A person's right to something must then be coupled with another agent's duty to provide the first person with that something. Those who insist on that binary linkage tend to be very critical in general of invoking the rhetoric of rights and human rights without exact specification of responsible agents and their duties to bring about the fulfillment of these rights. Demand for human rights are then seen, and this is what I quoted at the beginning, as loose talk. Maybe very good loose talk, but loose talk. A question that motivates some of this skepticism is how can we be sure that rights are in fact realizable unless they are matched by corresponding duties? Indeed, some do not see any sense in a right unless it is balanced by what Immanuel Kant called a perfect obligation, a specific duty of a particular agent for the actual realization of that right. That's what perfect obligation uh, stands for. This presumption can indeed be the basis of rejection of right-based thinking in many areas of practical reason. A very good example, a very clear, forceful um, presentation of this position can be found in my friend and colleague, colleague in Cambridge, Honora O'Neill's last book, Toward Justice and Virtue. I quote from Honora O'Neill. This is quotation. Unfortunately, much writing and rhetoric on rights heedlessly proclaims universal rights to goods and services, and in particular welfare rights, as well as to other social, economic, and cultural rights that are prominent in international charters and declarations without showing what connects each presumed right holder to some specific obligation bearer who leaves the content of these, which leaves the content of these supposed rights wholly obscure. This obscurity has been a scene and source of vast political and theoretical wrangling. Some advocates of universal economic, social, and cultural rights go no further than to emphasize that they can be institutionalized which is, of course, true. But the point of difference is that they must be institutionalized. If they are not, this is no right." Unquote. O'Neill, in fact, goes on to identify the constructive role in contrast of virtue instead of rights, since rights in this view make no sense when unaccompanied by specific path perfect obligations. So hers is the ethics of virtue. For example, so long as the putative right to food is not matched up with some particular person's or agent's specific obligation, the hungry do not really, in this reckoning, have a right to food at all. On the other hand, it would still be virtuous to feed the hungry. Even in the absence of rights, the ethics of virtue encourages those who can help the hungry to do just that, a virtuous deed. This line of reasoning has indeed considerable past persuasive power, and Honora O'Neill has done much to explore and illuminate the territory of virtue. 
our understanding of the role of virtue is significantly enriched by her constructive analysis in, in, the, in this book, Toward Justice and Virtue, and also by her the far-reaching investigation of a brilliant earlier book called Faces of Hunger. This is, deals with the role of sympathetic ethics and humane politics in the remedying of hunger in the com contemporary world. I strongly recommend that book. This was published in 1986, um, almost a decade and a half ago. Now, in contrast, I've argued elsewhere that we can do more justice to the idea of human rights by embedding them in a system of consequential evaluation that is justifying everything in terms of the totality of consequences everything considered. These consequential evaluation would justify any choice which would include the choice of what rights to acknowledge and this has to be done in terms of the totality of consequences. Now this is actually spelled out in an unpublished paper which hopefully sometimes will be published uh, which I gave last November in Cambridge. It's called Rights, Duties and Consequences. Utilitarianism is of course one type of consequential system. It's a good example of that. But it is a very limited type of consequential system constrained as it is by the kinds of consequences which are allowed to be taken note of. In particular, utilitarianism attaches no importance whatever to the goodness or badness of actions, nor the fulfillment or violation of acknowledged rights. It means nothing other than pleasure or desire fulfillment is allowed to count. And I've already argued why I think that's inadequate. If we take a broader approach to consequential evaluation, then the realization of specified rights can be part and parcel of the evaluation undertaken. Right-inclusive objectives and values of states of affairs and their implications can then be systematically worked out in consequential evaluation. The natural translation of such consequential reasoning is in the idea, into the idea of imperfect obligation, which too is a concept that Kant discussed with some care and fairly extensively. Virtue is not the only alternative to perfect obligation, and as and as Kant had noted, many of our actions and commitments relate to what we take to be our imperfect obligation, not the obligation specifically of me. The consequential framework can give a plausible account of imperfect obligations along with that of rights, the realization of which would be seen to be good. In the context of Honora O'Neill's question, we can ask why insist on the absolute necessity of co-specified perfect obligation for a putative right to qualify as a real right at all. Certainly a perfect obligation would help a great deal towards the realization of rights. But why cannot there be unrealized rights and under certain circumstances even unrealizable rights? We do not need any of we do not need in any obvious sense we Sorry, we need not in any obvious sense contradict ourselves by saying these people had all these rights but alas they were not realized because they were not institutionally grounded or because marginally they were not fully realizable. Something else has to be invoked to jump from pessimism about the fulfillment of rights to the way to all the way to the denial of the rights themselves. I'll have something more to say on that unrealizability in a minute because that's the most difficult point. This distinction may appear to be partly a matter of language and it might be thought that O'Neill's rejection could be based on how the term rights function in common language. Perhaps O'Neill is pointing to linguistic use and its discipline. But in fact the term rights is used much more widely than O'Neill demands. Indeed it is a significant part of her claim that the term rights is often used quite wrongly. She is not relying on language use, rather going against it. The language of rights in public as well as in public private discussion often proceeds without any clear identification of perfect obligation, namely who is going to bring this about. Rather the claim to which O'Neill gives expression 
must be based on the presumption that using rights in this way, what is seen by her as a wrong way, is full of internal problems which can be remedied only by more exacting specification of rights with correlated obligations. O'Neill's point, point then is not usage, but the cogency of usage. I would however resist the claim that any use of rights, except with calling perfect obligation, must lack cogency or co coherence. Indeed, it can be claimed that the problem that O'Neill perceives arises partly from her implicit attempt to see the use of rights in political and moral discourse through a close analogy with rights in a legal system, with its demand for specification of correlated duties. <coughs> In contrast, in normative discussions, rights are often championed as entitlements or powers or immunities which it, be, would, it would be good for people to have. Human rights are seen as rights shared by all, irrespective of citizenship, and the benefits of which everyone should have if they could. The claims are addressed generally, and as Kant might say imperfectly, to anyone who can help, even though no particular person or agency may be charged to bring about the fulfillment of the rights involved. Even if it is not feasible that everyone can have the fulfillment of their rights in this sense, if, for example, it's not yet possible to eliminate undernourishment altogether for everyone, credit can still be taken for the extent to which these alleged rights are fulfilled. The recognition of such claims as rights may not only be an ethically important statement, it can also help to focus attention on these matters, making their fulfillment that much more likely and quicker, which is, of course, from a consequential point of view, the most important thing to take note of. An analogy with utilitarianism may be helpful here. Utilitarian reasoning admits the possibility and excellence of everyone enjoying what Frank Ramsey a, a great utilitarian called bliss. Bliss is allegedly the highest level of utility that, that you can get to. And this is used in quite a lot of economic models. Ramsey himself, but the whole literature in optimum savings, optimum taxation, and so on, where the idea of bliss has been used. This is among the alternatives that are considered, that is, assume everyone had bliss. Indeed, it is the very best eventuality, but it is not of course claim that the utilitarian calculus would lack cogency if bliss for all is not realized or indeed were not realizable. Indeed, Ramsey not for one second presumed that bliss would be realizable. He was just looking how far of a departure it would be. He was, he was trying to minimize the gap between everyone having bliss all the time to what you actually happen to have and that gave his mathematical form if there's a mathematical issue, because if you have infinite time, actually, I don't know how much you want to go into it, you get these improper integrals, you cannot maximize, they all are infinitely large, you can't rank them. So what Bliss did was a, what um, Ramsey did was a rather smart mathematical technique. He had a level of Bliss being enjoyed by everyone, and you have lower than that utility, actually, and you get the approach and approach and approach, get closer. And the gap is actually not infinite. That is a finite and a well-defined object. And then you minimize that gap, which is the same as maximizing this improper integral. And that was mathematically, and he was a very smart mathematician, good trick. But no one said, how can you go on talking like that since bliss is not realizable? That's, that's not an issue. And, and that does not make the theory uh, a, 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 an incoherent theory. Similarly, rights inclusive objectives in a system of consequential evaluation can accommodate certain rights, the fulfillment of which would be excellent, but not guaranteed. Of course, if the holders of these rights fail to have full realization of these rights, then the state of affairs will fail to be as good as it might have been. But this is a matter of regret, and perhaps a reason for agitation for change when that is possible, but not a reason for declaring that the concept itself is incoherent. To conclude, the notion of human rights builds on our shared humanity. These rights 
are not derived from the citizenship of any country or the membership of any nation, but are taken as entitlements of every human being. It differs thus from constitutionally created rights, guaranteed for specified people, such as American citizens or Frenchmen. For example, the human right of a person not to be tortured is affirmed independently of the country of which this person is a citizen, and also quite irrespective of what the government of that country or any other wants to do. A government can, of course, dispute a person's legal right not to be tortured, but that will not amount to disputing what is seen as the person's human right not to be tortured, which is, of course, the force of the claim. In this paper, I have concerned three alleged difficulties with the use of the concept of human rights. The legitimacy critique does not survive scrutiny because of the distinction between legal rights and the ethical claims that people have to particular entitlements. And indeed, I argue that you cannot even see human rights as just potential legal rights. The idea that ethical claims cannot but be regionally constrained, the cultural critique, also proved to be hard to defend because of the arbitrarily divisive reading of the lines between the different cultures in the world. The third critique, in terms of the coherence of having rights that are not backed by perfect obligation, calls for a wider view of rights that are firmly embedded in a broadly consequential framework, which can indeed be developed. The alleged need for perfect obligations and the correlated duties, which are sometimes taken to be essential for making sense of rights, are overly restricted. Imperfect obligations can have an extensive role in making us understand such concepts as human rights and basic civil liberties, and they need not be dismissed just as loose talk. As it happens, communication and debating on rights, practical communication, practical debates, are full of serious difficulties and natural hurdles about what to include because of our substantial differences in our priorities, what's important to give the political liberty over, the right not to be hungry, etc. These are real problems. We need not add to these real problems a spurious one arising from a refusal to see the way rights and duties may be cogently understood in consequent oriented evaluation that includes human rights. The political philosophy of human rights calls for, not for misconceived dismissal, nor even for good-humoured tolerance of allegedly confused but well-meaning activists, but for a better understanding of the conceptual basis of these claims. The search for theoretical soundness need not, I have our good, militate against functional effectiveness. Indeed, the general discipline of practical reason mediates the two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sen. Uh, we're now open for questions, and we have a number of microphones. There is a microphone in the middle of the room here. There's also a microphone on the balcony. So uh, we, I, I would propose that we alternate uh, between, is there another one? Oh. Uh, we, that we will alternate uh, between the microphones. So please come forward uh, to ask your questions. And we have a first question here from Papo. Yes, you could use that, yeah. Uh, it seems to me that the most cogent of these three critiques is the coherence critique, the most serious of them. And one of the virtues of demanding perfect obligation is that it gives one a boundary as to what is a right and what is merely a desirable value. That is, you can locate an obligation, and if you can't locate an obligation, you don't have a right. What, you, what I thought you didn't answer is what, how you would draw that boundary, only requiring an imperfect obligation, those obligations could be more or less imperfect. Doesn't that make almost any desirable value into a prospective right? Or how do you draw the line between simply a desirable value and a right, given that you don't require a perfect obligation? I think that is indeed the right question to ask there. Um, let me make two preliminary points before answering your question. 
First, in a consequential system, even desirable things are good things, just as right fulfillments are. So there are no, there's not, unlike in right-based reasoning of a, uh, of, 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 say, Ronald Walken kind, let's say, uh, there isn't a line that I need to draw in, because they all are good things to have. Uh, but the distinction could be important, and you may well ask what the distinction is. And secondly, the, in terms of the obligation that it imposes, there is a difference between what Kant will call imperfect obligation as opposed to what will be called virtue by Honora O'Neill. Because it, if you were not to do a virtuous deed, it would not be seen as if, I mean, it, it would be good to do the virtuous deed, but if you were not to do it, do it you can't say you have failed in your obligation somehow. Whereas in the Kantian concept of imperfect obligation is much more demanding than that. And therefore there is a distinction between merely good things, which would be virtues to promote, and those good things which it would be culpable on our part not to, to, to do our bit in promoting. The case about human rights is just that. There is a lovely poem of a Bengali poem of Rabindranath Tagore when he's talking actually about, about torture and, and other kinds of iniquities and saying that when I, want to, when, I de- when I want to direct my anger, I cannot decide whether to direct it against those who, who perpetrate it or those who tolerate it. And that's not virtue. It's not just virtuous to prevent torturing. So I think there is a distinction here. And I would claim... You know, you know, Kantian scholarship, of course, I'm not a Kantian scholar at all. For one thing, I don't even read German. Even on consequences, I mean, Kant is on, so seen as a quintessentially anti-consequentialist consequential, figure. And yet, page after page of, of his writings are on the good consequences of these things. If they were really so irrelevant, why was Sir Kant so keen on showing that these good duties would also bring about very good results? Uh, I mean, I, I, I mean it's, if, it, if it had no bearing, it's very misleading for a reader. And if it does have a bearing, well, then it's not consequently independent. So I would say that if you take the breadth of Kantian view, one can think about distinction between perfect obligation, imperfect obligation, and near virtue. And I think all of them have some status. Now, on the subject of... Uh, I mean, this, I think, partly un- answers part of the question, I think, it has to be seen as to what kind of a failure it would be on the part of someone who has imperfect obligation not to do it. Imperfect obligation is not no obligation, which virtue is. Uh, the other thing is where it would be a bigger line to draw, and here I am going to be radical, and you better be prepared for that. Uh, it is this, that the... Um, you may win... To, I mean, most of the rights that would be major matters to dispute and argue about human rights are rights which are realizable. But I would not be opposed to putting in rights which are not realizable. Why? Well, first of all, even some of the most elementary rights are not really realizable. When you think, can we think of a society in which there will be no theft, no burglary, no murder? All these rights will be always fulfilled, when people say they're all realizable, they're talking high theory. I, I would say that we already have rights which are not fully realizable in the structure of what are taken to be realizable rights. So I think this distinction is very um, arbitrarily drawn. That's the first thing. Secondly, in a consequential system, you have to ask what would be the consequence of acknowledging these rights? If acknowledging the right of everyone to have enough food and medicine is to increase the proportion of people who do have rights and medicine, well, you have provided already a reason for taking those rights, everyone's rights, to be a basic human right, you know, even though it's not realizable form. And that is ultimately the reason for taking non-murder, non-theft, to be a, a, a right of everyone. 
not because it's believed that we would live in a society where all these rights would be realizable, but recognizing this is likely to increase the chances of realizability. That is a consequential work, world, even though many people who advocate it see themselves as, I think wrongly, as enormous enemies of consequential reasoning. So in that framework, I would say the real issue is what the effect of recognizing these rights would be. And the kind of thing human rights put forward, right not to be hungry, to have medicine, to have free speech, etc., even though they're not fully realizable, they are vindicated by their effect in terms of, again, the Ramsian thing, reducing the distance between an imaginable best, Im imaginable, unrealizable best, and the actual thing happens. And I would say, if I really had more time, I would say that exactly the same is true of the more standard kind of rights that people always talk about, because they don't seem to discuss the unrealizability adequately enough. The question I'm always stuck whenever I go to places where there are microphones and different things, why, how, how the concept of justice, spatial justice emerges, <laughs> that one group, well-defined, that's sitting here, has to have some same justice as another group sitting there. So I take it, it's your turn now. Uh, you make it sound like the uh, third uh, argument, the, the rights which involve obligations are the more difficult to achieve than, say, the freedom of speech or freedom of the press, just because of the added complication of finding out who's obliged to fulfill these rights. But from what I see you know, in the media, uh, it seems that countries which don't even put up a pretense of protecting what seem like the easier rights to provide freedom of speech or freedom of press, countries which don't even pretend to have those, still try, strive to provide what you seem to portray as the more difficult rights, uh, trying to provide their people with food and clothing and medicine when they wouldn't They provide. do try to provide. Right, whereas they would not try to provide the freedom of speech or the freedom of press. What kind of example do you have in mind? Uh, say, China or Iraq. While they may not, uh, you know, succeed in providing food, clothing, or medicine uh, to all of their people, they at least have that on their agenda, or at least profess to have it on their agenda, whereas uh, freedom of speech and press, uh, they don't make such a buzz about. Um, I, how do you explain that what seems like the more easy rights to provide are not provided, whereas the more difficult are at least on the agenda? But I don't think, first of all, I don't accept them as, uh, you know, you said that I seem to think that one of them are easier than others. Right. I didn't make that claim. You read that. Sorry. But I don't think they are like that. But also, um, you know, I don't know of any government which does not say that it would like to provide food to everyone and so on. That's standard rhetoric. Um, China did have a, as one of its commitment to feed everyone when it had the famine in which 30 million people died between 1958 and 61. And the occurrence of this famine was, I've tried to argue elsewhere, was possible because of the absence of these political rights. There was no opposition party to criticize the government. The government continued its failed policy of great leap forward for three years without backing out. That would have been impossible in a democracy if the government would have had to face opposition parties, newspaper criticism, and in particular, elections. So the idea that somehow it is possible to guarantee these other rights in the absence of the people who may suffer from it having a voice, which is what political liberty and democratic rights do, I think is very utopian thought. And I don't doubt for a second that the Chinese government was very well disposed to the idea of feeding everyone. But they made a mistake. They made a dreadful mistake. The um, agricultural system was near collapse. Um, province after province had millions of people dying. But there were no opposition party to write about it, no newspapers to editorialize on these report on it. The government itself was misled about the situation since they not, did not see any criticism, nor did they see any story of agriculture disaster, since communes were afraid to report that they, were, that they had done badly. 
they were under the impression all other communes were doing very well. So they misreported. So the government even had, didn't have enough information. And at the peak of the famine, they thought they, hundred, they had 100 million more metric tons of food than they actually had. So both the lack of political challenge and political incentive on one side, and the lack of adequate information, on which, by the way, Mao Zedong did speak in 1962, shortly after the famine, did make the country much more prone to these things. Now, you see, when a country, everything is going reasonably well, democracy and these political rights and civil rights are not that much missed. And when one, when one thinks about democracy movement, like in China, one is thinking of a situation, I mean, first of all, there is the issue that, uh, the Aristotelian point, that as human beings, our political participation is part of our humanity. But quite apart from that, the political incentive is an extremely important part of, um, of keeping the government in track when there is a threat of disaster, and which is, may not be perceived when things are going fine. When Indonesia went up and up and up, democracy was not missed at all. But when it suddenly collapsed, then I'm afraid the fact that the people who were suffering were voiceless made a big difference. So I think this idea that you could go ahead and satisfy these quote-unquote simpler rights like food, etc., and then think about democracy and human rights, I think that stage-wise thinking simply doesn't work. There's no evidence for it. There's no evidence for Iraq in Iraq either. I could have spoken about Iraq too. This is not to say that um, uh, one, uh, one must accept all the negative things one sees, hears about them. I think there are a lot of great things happening in China and to some extent even had happened in Iraq. But guaranteeing these rights to all is not one of them. And I think one of the reasons, if I may make a political point here, why I believe the strategy of um, uh, 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 the, the, the Western strategy on Iraq has been so ineffective, I don't mean only the bombing, but also the boycott is the same reason for which you cannot bring down a dictator on the basis of a famine. That is, you could, you might put embargoes and the population may suffer a lot, and had it been a democratic country, Saddam Hussein might have lost his office. But if it's not a democratic country, you don't do that. You actually solidify him, you know, because he had the control over the entire media behind him. And that is actually as much a criticism of the Western strategy on, on Iraq as it is of Iraq itself. So I'd like to make both this point in that context. And so given the fact that there are other questions possibly, I won't speak to you about Kosovo at this time. Yes, would you like to ask a question? Well, I, I'd like to ask you a question, Professor Sen. Um, I very much agree with you on the, the point about the, oh, so, excuse me, sorry. You, sorry. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I very much agree with your, your point uh, cautioning us against the simplistic dichotomies between the West and the rest, you know, that, that for example, Professor Huntington's work uh, suggests, and, the, and the, that it's important for us to recognize that impulses for, you know, arguments for liberty, for example, have appeared in all cultural contexts. Uh, we find in, in, uh, in Asian cultures, as well as in Western culture, both strands of arguments for liberty, as well as strands of arguments for authoritarian rule as well. My question, though, is what about the claim that there is something peculiar about the rise of a kind of dominant rights rhetoric in the modern West? Uh, which has certainly now become very much a part of, of the rhetoric of a lot of peoples across the world and a lot of different cultures. But do you have any thoughts on what explains, or, I mean, do you think that there is something sort of distinctive about um, not so much the presence of these arguments for the importance of individual liberty, for example, but their political dominance in a, in a particular uh, historical and cultural context? Yeah, but I think um, you say particular historical and cultural context. That's what you have to see, the historical context. If you could take the view, as, as Huntington does, um, or Himmelfarb does, that these ideas existed in the West well before modernization, that would be a different claim. 
Although Berlin had a very good discussion as to why none of these ideas could be seen in, in, the, in, the, in the ancient literature, Greek or Roman literature. And he argues that it is certainly post-Enlightenment and possibly at most latter part of Renaissance coming in. Now, lots of things have happened in the world and some, you know, you can't find antecedents in the West, but you can find antecedents elsewhere. As referring to Ashoka, I can give you a quotation which is exactly about the right to tolerance. Ashoka was, you see, there was an interesting difference between Ashoka and Akbar, two, who, two very tolerant rulers of India. Akbar, who was a Muslim ruler, was very keen on the right of everyone. Um, I might say it's quite interesting because, you know, we are at the end of a millennium now, and when the preceding millennium came, the Christian, 1000 AD, there was an enormous panic called Millennium Panic. Uh, the corresponding thing, millennium, first millennium in the Hegira calendar, uh, the Muslim Hegira calendar, happened around 1591-92, when Akbar was in office. There wasn't any, the sense of the world coming to an end wasn't there. Uh, indeed, Akbar used that occasion to make great pronouncement on human rights. And it's interesting, by the way, if had Akbar's pronouncement come in Europe and had the panic come in India, it would have been immediately attributed to the natural tendency towards mystical thing in the India as opposed to rational thinking in the West. Now, Akbar proceeded to discuss why everyone has a right to their own religion. If somebody had been forcibly convicted, he must be given the opportunity to go back, given the real right of choice on that, and went on and on on that issue. He himself was very concerned that he belonged to one religion where he wanted tolerance of all. And he, towards the end of his life, he also tried to construct a combined religion called Din Ilahi, the religion uh, that would com combine all the religions. Ashoka's attitude is quite different and in some ways a little, I mean, they're both very liberated attitudes, but in some ways more in line with Rawls, I would say, Ashoka's attitude was, he was a firm Buddhist, very keen on spreading Buddhism, indeed the spread of Buddhism across, out of India, was almost due to Ashoka, he even sent his children as emissaries. And yet, there was this question that you must, every religion must have a right to say, and you must never speak ill of them, never stifle their right to speech. And he thought it was entirely consistent to have advocacy on his side, and at the same time, tolerance of other points of view. Now these are the meat of subjects. If you read Rawls's part one <laughs> of theory of justice, that is the meat of present day debate. So had, the, had these developments taken place in Asia, you would have looked for antecedents here rather than antecedents in Aristotle. I think it's so much backward looking, determined by that, that I think it's very important to bear this in mind. Now it's true the world has been very different since the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment, but we don't say, look, radio or television was evolved in the West and is quintessentially a Western culture and it would be wrong, and indeed some people have done, in, some fundamentalists have done, that these Western tools should not be used in, in, in Asia, but these people don't take that view because you, it, it is an accidental fact that it happened to emerge in Asia, in, in Europe, but the fact of the matter is that people have reason to adopt them anywhere. So the real question is whether you have a reason to adopt or not and I think the historical scholarship which sees this big division is really, really very shallow. I'm just to end up with one final example. In the early 11th century, uh, India had a visitor from Iran um, um, who, uh, called Al-Biruni, who wrote a book in Arabic as it happened, that was his main language, called India. In fact, it's the first book called India. It's really a wonderful book. It's around 11 or 8, or 10 or 8, somewhat before normal conquest. Discusses various beliefs, various philosophies, and he was himself a mathematician. And he translated two books in mathematics from, uh, from uh, Sanskrit into Arabic. And he wrote about trigonometry and algebra and so forth. Um, one of his quotes, which is not relevant to this, but I can't resist quoting since you are uh, in this territory. He's discussing about what's so nice about Indians. And he said, you know, these mathematics and the philosophy of these people are very impressive. 
but nothing as impressive, she says, as the ability of the Indian to speak eloquently on subjects on which they know absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but then it goes on to say that why is it so important for us to study these things? And he said the reason is every culture has great suspicion about other culture because we have a suspicion of the unfamiliar. People dress differently, talk differently, and suspicion is immediately aroused. And what is therefore important in international, he didn't use the word, in communication in the world, is to overcome our natural suspicion of foreigners. Now, I think that is a very modern thought, even though expressed in 1008. Yes. Uh, uh, you see, we have here in the West, we have this quite common opinion, which which we see this picture of refugees, and we all think about suffering of these human beings, yes? About suffering Albanians who were expelled by Serbs from Kosovo. But at the same time, you know, I'm from Russia, and I called to home, and I know that in Russia there was some kind of almost mass hysteria, and as I understand, in Serbia also, which, which it, it strikes me how different this point of view is. You see, do you remember there was a debate in the 17th century that uh, people can, you have n right to, um, uh, to, to, be, uh, to sell yourself in, slave, in slavery. So you have right to what? Uh, to, to sell yourself uh, in slavery. In slavery, yes. Yes, and you see, in this uh, horrible national conflict which we uh, regretfully see all this century, there is some kind of position. If these people don't want to live with us, it's their choice. And they will have cost, you see? And uh, yeah, as they, if this they will have, I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty following. Yeah. The sound is not good. If, if these people, as Serbs think about Albanians, don't want to live with us, and they became, you know, follow, of course, it's not uh, fair judgment on Serbs' part, but it's their judgment, it seems. Uh, they don't want to live with us, they, and they go, they go um, follow the radicals, let them have price and price will be horrible, as we can see. But what is interesting to me, I rather disagree with your idea that there's West values and non-West values. I was grown up in Soviet Union, and I remember that Sakharov point of view, the naval school girl, was rather unacceptable for me. And, uh, what, what, I'm sorry, Sakharov, what was unacceptable? Uh, uh, Andrei Sakharov. Sakharov, you know, we have this, our great, Oh, Zakharov, oh, yes, Zakharov yes. point of Zakharov, view. Zakharov, yes, indeed, yes. Yes, was because, you see, problem, I think, with this society, in society, non this society, is that we really grow, we were grown up in different system, and, um, and uh, you yourself agree that open society, and uh, which come to Asia, and uh, as a Japan changed for 100 years, which has become more open and more individually minded, it's everybody will agree to accept individualistic institution, but problem is, if we don't have such tradition behind us, you see, regretfully, people um, don't have these open eyes. For example, they accept some kind of values. You know, we have 15% of the population in Russia who vote for liberal parties, you know? And you can say that all these people they agree, and I quite agree, they, they, don't, they maybe have the same quite good about motherhood, fatherhood, and brotherhood, and sisterhood. But at the same time, they, uh, they, cannot, they somehow cannot accept this value of toleration, of different values. And I think it's, it's you can say that the great um, Western values, and uh, I quite agree with this, and we can see it especially, you know, after really, modern time, how West is much more happy place to live in comparative with <laughs> regretfully known different, different world. And, but at the same time, you see, I think this conception of unlimited human rights also can face, maybe not this century, but maybe another century, such kind of question um, about, for example, what about um, such values which you can uh, think as a fair, fair battle, is a good values to have choose everything, but which destroy family life, for example. Wait, yes, I, uh, which, which destroy family life, for example, destroy the value of traditional family. For family, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and and uh, um, it's 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 different question from my Kosovo question, but it's question: Can you limit it? Uh, this is a, a space of choosing. 
You see, sometimes it can, uh, it can, in can in opposite to destroy our basic value. If we destroy our basic institution as a family, and you know, and uh, what we will have, it's even more terrible. Maybe than destroy private property. Okay. As, I, 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 thank you very much. I think that we have two questions there. If I if I understood yeah. the questioner, please. No, but you <laughs> tell me what the two are. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, I, I believe that the first question was that that um, the, the, the questioner was saying, well, is it is it actually the case that uh, that human beings have this capacity for uh, tolerance, tolerance? Yeah. and and is that capacity uh, differently this? distributed yeah. across cultures? Yeah. And she was uh, using as an example her own. Um, uh, experience of growing up in the Soviet Union where she felt yeah. that there was only a very small minority of people who were who were willing to be tolerant. The second question I'm less perhaps you could answer the first question and I'll, I'll think, try well, to think, think, of think of what the second question was. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the uh, the capacity of tolerance um, and I think one of the things that John Rawls calls one of the moral powers that we all have. That in his system is a basic belief, which he doesn't give any empirical evidence for, but simply assumes that that is indeed the case. And I think that's, in my judgment, that's not a bad assumption, because in very many different types of cultures, um, both failures and successes in this respect have occurred. So. Um, I think it, I, you know, I don't want to make a claim but that the capacity for tolerance is homogeneously distributed, you know, with equal intensity everywhere in the world. I have no reason to assume the contrary. I have some reason to believe that some of the things that are mentioned, given as evidence of lack of tolerance of cultures, are very history dependent, period dependent. I mean, Take the Western uh, thing. I mean, the, it's often said it is the quintessential place for tolerance. When Akbar was writing those things about 1591, tolerance, the Inquisition were in full swing in Europe. In this century, we have had Holocaust and concentration camps. And this idea that some nations are immune from intolerance and others are, um, are, are, are you know, I mean, this, this kind of classification I think is very difficult to present because their varieties exist so much. Now if you think about Arabic civilization, Islamic civilization, from the time, if you think about at one time when the Arabic civilization was at its power, there were Greek classics which had been dying off in Greece itself, but survived in Arabic translation. Indian mathematics, along with Arab mathematics, and Indian mathematics went to the Europe through Arab world. Indeed, the Arabic numerals came from Indian to Arabic to Europe. And they were enormous tolerance. And yet, when one thinks about Arabic Islamic culture today, one tends to think of it as being very combative and not really quite so open. So I think the historically these variations have been so great that it seems to me that the burden of proof would have to lie on those who claim that there are big differences in the capacities of people in different parts of the world to show why we should believe it. Because the usual evidence that's given are so historically contingent and so much variation is observed that one does not get any empirical support for that proposition. So it's not my claim that toler capacity for tolerance is equally distributed across the world, but I see no reason to assume the contrary on the basis of what we know at this time. We, uh, we, my thanks to uh, Bob Cohan for, for uh, restating the second question, and this will have to, I think, be the, the, the last question, and then we invite people to, uh, to ask Professor Sen at the reception. Uh, additional questions, but the second question uh, is, are universal concepts of human rights subversive of traditional institutions such as the family?
Oh, is that what you meant? Yeah, got, got. Oh, that will go. That will go. <laughs> yes, I think uh, at some level it could be subversive to family. Because I, and, and I think it, it's, a, it's a difficult question to take on as the last one. Uh, because I believe it's subversive and rightly so. Because the, the basic constituent of the human rights is the individual, not a family. And that applies particularly when you think about divisions like gender divisions. The human rights involving rights of women may well militate against the family values as they exist in a particular society at that time. And indeed, activist gender politics in many countries, including in my own in India, has been one of the factors that has been posited against family values that have been published, uh, you know, that, that have been um, articulated and defended. What you have to ask is whether these will be, remain so acceptable if they were to ask these questions about the basic human rights that we all have. Are we getting equal treatment? Are we getting equal care? Or are we getting attention that corresponds to the nature of the illness or the nutritional deficiency that we happen to have? I think one of the ways that iniquities survive is to make, by making allies out of the underdog and the exploited. I was very struck when at the end of my first set of famine studies of 1943, Bengal famine in which three million people died, 44 there was a medical um, survey in the same area. And I remember looking at some data, and particularly I had a whole lot of data about widows and widowers. There were lots of them because people had died. And one of the remarkable features was that while widowers, men, complained violently about being in bad health condition. Women very rarely did. Indeed, those with diagnosed medical condition as ill sometimes did acknowledge being ill. On the category, which is the most important one, called are you in indifferent health? 43% of the widowers confessed to be on that state. The percentage of widows saying that they were in that state was exactly zero. And I think what you're noticing here is not in incredibly better health of women compared with men, but just a sense of what it is thought to be fair to grumble about and what is taken to be standard arrangement. So any society, when it's operating on its values, state has an idea of normality. And what human rights does, the literature of human rights and the rhetoric of human rights and the demand of human rights, is to bring in, from outside, as it happens, a set of questions to be posed within the family. Now, they may be a dissenting set of questions. They may sow dissension within the family by people asking these questions. But if you take the view that without these demands, these iniquities would not be removed, you may not regret the fact that the human rights uh, literature may actually have those subversive implications on the family. <laughs>